Hey, hey, people. So, Dark Souls 3 is out and it's a somber yet long-awaited finale to the series that has certainly had its ups and downs. There is a staggering amount of things to talk about when it comes to the Souls series, but this video I will be focusing on mostly on this third game and how it compares to the rest and how it stands as a game on its own. For posterity's sake, I'll mention that this video is made two weeks after the public release of the game, and I've since played it for a hundred hours, and as it stands, there's no current DLC for the game. And of course, there's obviously going to be some spoilers ahead, so proceed at your own risk, because, you know, a blind playthrough is the real way to experience this game. So what's it about? Yeah, it's a Souls game as you know it, and if you've played any of the previous installments, you know exactly what you're gonna get. And to lay a foundation for my views and experiences with them, I feel like it's worth mentioning that I have not played Demon Souls, but I've sank roughly 300 hours into Dark Souls 1 and 2, and then I played Bloodborne like twice. And I'm not saying these things to measure my EP in, nope, but I feel like if you understand my sort of background and experience with the games, you can judge for yourself whether I'm full of shit or if I have a clue as to what I'm talking about. Each of these games from 1 to 2 to now 3 I've always played through with a quality build with a dash of pyromancy on the side. And the games were of course played completely blind as in without any sort of beforehand knowledge of the locations and bosses and such. Which I think makes for a roughly equal footing when it comes to comparing the gameplay experiences. So how does this game hold up? From the floating combat and control of Dark Souls 2 it feels like the game has gone back to the relatively rigid handling of DS1 with a dash of Bloodborne on the side. Well, there's no luck on dashing, but the fast pace is certainly more pronounced than in previous installments. For example, instead of equip burden affecting you by tiers, uh, like fast, medium and fat rolling, here the only number you need to watch out is the 70% burden, since staying below or strictly at there grants you the most benefits and anything above that reduces your stamina regeneration and forces you to do the clumsy fat roll. Yet, for some reason there is no actual, functional and a really useful tier below 70% burden. It could be said though that when you are hovering below 30%, which is, mind you, near impossible to do without investment into vitality stat and the usage of extremely light gear, you will roll noticeably further but you do not gain any other benefits. Let's think back to Dark Souls 2 here, where, if I'm correct, equipment burden tiers to 10, 30, 50 and 60% and they all affected your stamina regeneration and rolling distance. This all, to me, seems to indicate that the developers wanted you to learn to use and kind of gauge your stamina more efficiently, yet it hardly makes a difference when you can roll roughly 13 times with a full stamina bar and still have enough iframes to escape invaders and most of the enemies as well. Another example when it comes to the pace of the game's combat, later and later on in the game, enemies become mostly faster and more aggressive. Perhaps I played wrong, but for example the uh, champion variant of the Udex Gundir boss fight in the untended graves hardly left windows for any swings of the old ultra crate swords. I understand that the boss is very, very much vulnerable to parries as we can probably see here on my faster playthrough. But for most of the time I found myself chipping away at faster foes by roll spamming my way out of their attacks and occasionally landing the R1, whereas bosses like the Pontiff I shatter shattered with the same weaponry due to the, mind you, extremely lax hyper armor and the staggering weapon arts of said weaponry. I understand that this might sound like nitpicking, but after hundreds of hours spent with the series, you kinda start to notice some of these things that maybe they could have done a little better. But this tangent has gone on for long enough, and I'll be sure to touch on the comparisons between the games here and there. To me, the enemy design in these games has always been among the more interesting facets. Even if three games down the line, the hordes of enemies you face can still be sorted into enemies that are smaller than you, enemies that are roughly your size, and on the third slot, the monstrous enemies, it still hasn't gotten old. It manages to stay fresh due to the variety in the tactics that the enemies employed, while the Lothric Knights, which we see here, 
rely on their shields and the occasional weapon art move or a shield bash if you fish for backstabs, the Silver Knights later on in the game employed tried and true moves from Dark Souls 1 with a nice new twist. There's the Evangelists in the Undead Settlement, for example, with their super varied movesets. There's the Cathedral Knights with their relentless aggression, all the way to the player-sized NPC encounters like the Exiles and the Invaders. And it's been an absolute joy to fight through them time and again, because variety is really the impression that I've gotten with this third game. Sadly though, even with so many games and years of development under their belts, the enemy AI is still extremely exploitable. It's, there's like nothing stopping you from finding where they're leashed to and then peppering them with poison arrows. But to offset this, there's obviously steps that they've taken forward. In this game, they, for example, have nailed the enemy crowd so much better, lending to clearly lessons learned in Bloodborne. If you remember the enemy mobs like the spiders in Zeldora in Dark Souls 2, they would slowly creep up their way to you and proceed to spam attacks until you die, or in return spam attacks quickly enough to thin their numbers. Whereas here in Dark Souls 3, enemy hordes like the workers in the settlement may gang up on you with big numbers, but much like Bloodborne, if you stumble and try to roll your way through them, they will actually stagger and lose their attack windups. Obviously this doesn't work with larger enemies, but here the enemy placements do not seem unfair or difficult for the sake of being difficult, something which the second installment of the series I felt was very guilty of. The enemy encounters might be what makes combat fun and engaging, but what is a fight without a setting? Honestly, this time around the area center designs are simply gorgeous, like this uh, graveyard of little to no appetite to the high wall of Lothric with its bell ringers rousing the sleeping hollows, the swamp with the sneaky sneaky grooves, the grand archives with all the wizardry within. It all looks and feels cohesive and brilliant, and there's not really an area where the design clashes for me. Well, maybe if we scratch a bit beyond the surface, the connection between Farron Keep to Catacombs to Irithyll seems a little challenged when it comes to abrupt climate differences, but honestly, after the Earthen Peak to Iron Keep immersion ball kick, nothing feels as bad. <sighs> now I'm going to show you a few pictures. I couldn't for the life of me find out who made them, but they're incredibly useful, so if you're out there, thank you. And as you can tell, they depict the connection between the zones, and yes, you might have heard these complaints many times before, but I much prefer the long-term implications of the Dark Souls 1 model of world design without the bonfire warping. Since every outing you started um, from Firelink in the early game, it had a sense of gravity to it, and if you forgot to upgrade your filthy little drake sword, then too bad! You would have to mosey your way back, cursing your inattention all the way. I always felt like forcing you to travel by foot pre-lord vessel, equipped only with the most rudimentary knowledge of the game, it made for a fond memory for me, and I really had hoped that there was more of this in Dark Souls 3. But instead, warping between the bonfires is available right from the get-go, much like in DS2, but luckily, where the world scale design may have continued to suffer, the level design is on point. I mean, flipping heck if the areas with their gauntlets of enemies and the occasional requirements of observational skills weren't good or what, save for maybe the aforementioned catacombs, which were basically a glorified challenge dungeon. But even there, the design was tight, like, you know, those skeleton men with the hats who control the <laughs> skeleton balls and how they ran around, leading you into that one area full of pots and the other skellies who threw freaking pursuer grenades at you. So, when it comes to level and world design, I'll just want to reiterate that I much prefer the large and more interconnected areas, where all the shortcuts link back to <laughs> previous areas and previous shortcuts over this more level-oriented design, which, granted Dark Souls 1, was also guilty of after you got the Lord Vessel. But yeah, it's just my preference. I just simply loved the emergent gameplay stories that this large-scale world design offers, as in, you know, everyone probably has their own story of wandering into New London on their first character on their first playthrough. So, moving on to NPCs and other stuff that makes the world live. 
A very curious thing I noticed uh, during my playthroughs is that they chose to omit the sensible design for NPCs and how they make their way back to the hub areas. For example, you all remember how when you introduce yourselves to NPCs in the previous games, you'd basically exhaust their dialogue and they'd exclaim how they'd, well, basically do whatever they need to do and then head back to the hub area where you can buy stuff or learn stuff from them there. Instead, here in Dark Souls 3, you just talk to them and you just agree to help them or whatever, and then they literally poof out of their actual cells where they've been holed up before you came along. It's it's a really strange thing to change, and I don't see any reason for it. And so, a little more about the usual cavalcade of walking, talking, self-confirming tropes that are back in this cesspool of doddering old folk and degenerates, all the way from the crestfallen warrior to trusty patches, the unbreakable hyena, he's back and they're all with their own personal storylines, which are just as easy to miss as they were in the previous games. But here, I'm kind of noticing the sort of obscurity for obscurity's sake. For example, in the Andre questline, there was this assassin character, just chameleoned up in the church where she was holding up, and there was no indication of such a thing hiding there. Nor did she seem to mind being ritual murdered <laughs> in the wedding ritual or whatever. Oh, although, thank Miyazaki, the NPCs in general are luckily a step up from the shoddy work of Dark Souls 2, because you might remember the Cloan catastrophe that happened there. Here, the NPCs just require to be rescued, and they ask a favor for their services, up to a point where they might even pack up and leave if you don't meet their conditions, which is nice to see, instead of just having to tick a box and have them permanently move into your hub. It makes the world feel like it's not revolving around you, and that's very much a welcome thing in these games. Now, moving on, I've written on this script in rather hesitantly that I should probably touch on the balance side of the game's character builds and equipment, so... Uh, here we go. So, for me, the big part of the series' appeal was playing the type of character I wanted to and sticking to my guns no matter what. But in this game, I've really come to love some of the choices made. Take, for example, the aforementioned equipment burden. For example, the only, and I repeat, only thing that matters is that you hover uh, at 70% burden or just below to get the most of the benefits. It doesn't reward me for playing a lightly armored swordsman who hangs around at 50% burden by granting me some stamina region or a roll distance like in the earlier games. No matter how small the benefits were, they were still there. Similarly, the players with the penchant for the more heavier armor, you'd have to level up vitality to unlock exactly what? A little more defense and poise? That'd be the case, yes, if you were playing an earlier game. Here it grants you some absorption, which is basically percentage-based uh, reduction of damage taken. And yes, you get poise as well, but I can't crack how on earth that works since it just frankly doesn't seem to. I literally run up to Havel the Rock or whoever wearing his armor, hit him once with the old monastery scimitar, and the first hit staggered him. <laughs> What's happened? So I honestly don't understand whether this is intentional or frankly bugged. No matter how heavily I've kitted up on poise, the first two swings from a straight sword always staggered the character. Besides poise, the saving grace for strength-oriented characters has always been hyper armor that's built in with their weapons movesets. If you're not familiar with the concept, what it means is that at a certain point in your heavy weapon swing, the damage you take is reduced to offset the fact that your longer animations will often result in you getting hit, in addition to granting you a massive poise boost to guarantee that the attack actually goes through. Yet, in DS3, I played around with great swords, both of the ultra and the normal variety, and I'm not sure if it's just me, but the amount of frames you are granted hyper armor for is reduced. I honestly hope that I'm just wrong or just plain bad at the game, but if it is intentional design, I can't comprehend it, I just cannot. And while we're on the topic of poise and balance, I really have to bring up the worst offenders of the bunch. You might see some of these clips that I am utilizing the dark sword, and you can see a theme there. A lot of people are rolling with the straight swords, since poise doesn't frankly seem to work, and these weapons offer you a nice reach, 
uh, they don't consume much stamina, attacks are often guaranteed to go through and stagger when they do hit, leading to massive combos, which frankly makes the online PvP, which grants the game a lot of its longevity, it makes it a bit of a clusterfuck, to be honest. Then again, maybe I just need to get good. On the topic of balance, I'm not sure if I'm right or wrong here, but frankly, some of the weapons seem to be skewed towards unviability, if you will, with poor scalings right from the get-go. Upgrading, for example, a great scythe felt like a gamble, and slapping on an infusion gem if I enjoyed the moveset was often just about punished by it being outclassed by, you guessed it, a traditional longsword. I do understand while some of these weapons might be blatantly inferior to others, and that's fine, really, it's just part of the game, but the heavy, sharp and refined infusions, which I initially found to be brilliant addition, or re-addition from the Demon Souls days, more often than not, had me wondering whether it was worth the gamble to waste a gem on a weapon that just might end up being shit regardless. But there is a lot of weapons this time around, which just speaks volumes of the game's variety once again. They might not all be good, but some of them are keepers. This infusion problem I found was somewhat rectified with an abundance of titanite being available throughout the game. For example, the Lothric Knights later on in the castle were an extremely reliable source of large titanite, and the Grus in the Smoldering Lake dropped more small titanite than I could ever find a purpose for. And this all led me to upgrading just about every weapon I ever had picked up, just for the sake of trying it out, and with the early game indecisiveness as you pick these things up, it never felt like I was being punished for swapping my weapons more often than I changed my own socks. And honestly, the variety of medieval death dealers available was honestly surprising, especially with the addition of these weapon arts, which basically grant each weapon either a buff or two extra moves at the cost of focus points on the blue bar, or mana if you will. Some of them even mix and match moves from different types of weapons. I have to mention the Astora Greatsword with its spear-like charge and the Thrall Axe for its quickstep skill, which are taken from spears and daggers respectively. Again, it adds so much variety to weapons that might otherwise seem very samey. And yes, the poise boosting weapon art in most hammers I found to be very useful on my strength playthrough. So all in all, I'd say the weapons have actually reached their peak in the series here despite being occasionally tragically undertuned in numbers. Sadly, there isn't a right without a wrong, and most of the boss weapons I found belong into the strange category where they might be unique and gorgeous to use, but if I'm not wrong, not one of them could be infused to fit your character build better, which I found quite strange. To bring up another curious thing that they've chosen to omit from the game is the removal of power stance from Dark Souls 2, the dual wielding mechanic if you will. It might not have been perfect, but it certainly did work and it added a nice dynamic style of play for those few people who desperately wanted to swing around their double swyhanders. Now instead we have these paired weapons which you might see here on this long ass weapon clip. <laughs> And these paired weapons, which when wielded in one hand function much like any other weapon of the group that they belong in, and when you wield them with two hands, they basically function like the trick weapons from Bloodborne with unique movesets, combos and special attacks. And while we're on the topic of weapons in combat, the few dark beat spamming scrubs out there might finally have to get good, since holy heck did they hammer all the magics down to the ground, save for maybe pyromancy which I found to be extremely fun, with all the focus points and having to allocate essences to replenish it, unless you're a shifty cleric, it's really gonna hamper your healing, and if that wasn't a hindrance enough, magic hardly seems worth it unless you wear one of the crutch rings, a spell boosting ring, the cast speed ring, and on top of that, dump at least 40 to 50 points in your casting stat of choice. Personally, I don't really mind this too much, since I always thought that magic was a supplementary thing, and never the main way to play the game, but I can see this change upsetting some people, and even then the design is almost contradictory, since there's these Pharaon spells available in the game, which they are much faster to cast and clearly more combat oriented than the usual soul arrows and stuff, but they do much, much less damage than your normal magic weapon enchanted longsword would. 
So it does seem like after Dark Souls 2 and the climax bullshit, we've dove on to the absolute opposite end. So R.I.P. Wizards, I guess? So throughout the games that's been a regular feature, what's one thing that you would have liked to see them improve? Well, for me, Covenants would probably be among the top things I wish they had built and expanded on in this game, but sadly, they're just about untouched. The rank up and reward systems are identical to their earlier counterparts, yet somehow they've managed to muck up the matchmaking. Think of the Dark Moons and the Blue Sentinels and how they actually have the same goal, yet Blues have no ranking system whatsoever, and they effectively only mooch a spot that a Dark Moon could have used to rank up in his covenant. And oh my goodness when it comes to invading. Now, this might change given enough time, but as it stands, I simply cannot invade a player by his lonesome. And even if they happen to be alone, chances are that a aforementioned blue or a dark moon pops in. Sure, the playing field is evened out by giving the invaders some estus charges as well, but it's always roughly half of what the host of the world has. On top of that, items such as Lloyd's Talismans or hun Undead Hunter Charms, as they're called now, are limited to 5 per invasion, and often enough, that, that's, that, that won't do against the host and his two compeers. At least a full Red Eye Orb is available very early, but as it stands, you're always invading against the odds, which I think is fine, but I can only hope the amount of summoned gangs is lower in the future, because right now, it's really hard to play, honestly. It feels like they've shot invasions into foot on this one. Alright, now on to the more artistic sides of the game. Um, do you like hearing European men butcher Japanese names? Because I sure as heck do. So, yeah. The music's composed by Motoi Sakuraba, who made music for Dark Souls 1, 2, and now 3, and it's also composed by Yuka Kitamura, who made music for Dark Souls 2 and 3, and also Bloodborne. And it's really worth listening to. I found in some bosses I would actually take extra time to kill them to catch a few more seconds of these tunes. It's clear that the worksmanship of Miyazaki and the team behind him hasn't gone to waste since even this encounter here that you're seeing, the Deacons of the Deep fight, which is basically, to the more cynical among us, a rehash of the Prowling Magus fight. But it's not without its little details. You can see the taller priests in the back actually reaching up and shooting fireballs uh, over the top of their more smaller compatriots while the <laughs> more tubby ones tend to charge and try to smash you to the ground. It's really nice. Even for such a, well, lukewarmly received encounter, it, it does have its pins and twists and nearly every boss does. So the music sets the tone and the area is certainly built for a nice stage and the gameplay certainly delivers on the storytelling front as well. Much like in Dark Souls 1 you're given a simple goal to find and deliver the Lords of Sender to their thrones and as you go along you learn more and more about the world around you and how it came to pass the way that it is. As some of you long-standing hollows there might know, the overarching theme of the game is just as important as the bits and pieces you can glue together from the item descriptions. And from the relatively simple adventure and heat death of the universe of Dark Souls 1, to the overbearing, well almost overbearing cyclism of Dark Souls 1, in Dark Souls 3 I personally found the theme to be very very much rooted in nostalgia and longing as the item descriptions refer to characters you know full well, but the world has long since forgotten. Once well-known names have faded into obscurity and only bits and pieces of the old lore survive, yet their ramifications are felt strongly in the current uh, state of the world. Take Irithyll and the doll for example and make the connection to Anne Orlando the doll and the painted world and there you have a match. There are also a lot of connections you can make between Archdragon Peak, Nameless King and Gwyn and his Dragon Wars and the basically denouncing his firstborn son. It once again sets the tone for a very much world dying and fading away and it's, it's a sobering and quite the somber farewell to a series that many have come to know and love. And yes, I realize these are very much subjective things, but that's, that's just my take on it. It still manages to pull the soul special, aka emotional impact through gameplay and artistry alone, since I just have to mention what a rush it was to catch up with Aldrich and, in a way, 
experience the atrocities through the music and the encounter alone. Same with the last boss. There's incredible intricate talent there, and I seriously just hope there was so much more of it. Lastly, I want to touch on the technicalities of the game, and especially the PC port, which was released simultaneously with the console release. But even after the years, there are questionable details, such as the PC port displaying keybinds for controllers by default. I seriously hope this was an issue with my emulated controller rather than with the game, but I thought it was worth a mention. Another thing to look out for is the performance. Uh, while my rig exceeds the recommended specs, I'm experiencing massive frame drops in areas with dense fog or smoke, and sort of when entering through borders to other areas, as if there was so little preloading to begin with. But I've heard uh, rumors for and against of the PC port, and some people have it run just fine, and some people are experiencing like game-breaking crashes, so your mileage may vary. So, at the end of the day, is it a good game? Yes, very much so. Then why all the complaints and the critique, you might ask? And I feel like they've changed so little and didn't seek to innovate with this game, but rather redo the charm and success of DS1. Which honestly, after these three games, it may just be me having played my share of hours, but it might be getting a little old. I love the game, I do but some of these flaws and outright downgrades are hard to justify in my eyes. It is a Souls game through and through, and I can see myself playing it for many hours to come. It is sad that the series is coming to an end, but maybe the eventual DLC will bring out the true shine of the game. Maybe it gets a Scholar of the First Sin treatment, and that'll stretch my wallet further. Maybe Miyazaki gets locked up somewhere and they're going to milk this series for all the dough that they can. And even then, I honestly wouldn't mind, since at the end of the day, the quality may vary, but the games are still so much better than a great deal of others out in the market. And frankly, it fills such a nice little niche spot that I don't think I could ever have enough of it. So, thank you for watching and long may the sun shine!